Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all this morning and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change our world. And the very heart of our National Geographic community is our explorers. So our National Geographic explorers are cutting edge scientists. They're amazing researchers, powerful storytellers, adventurers, filmmakers, photographers, conservationists. Really, if you name it, there's a National Geographic explorer out there in the world doing it. But one thing that they all have in common is that they love to share their work with students like you. So these Explorer Classroom events give us a chance to bring that exploration to life. Our explorers give a short lesson and our students run an extended Q&A. Um, they're really quite fun. And this fall, we're hosting Explorer Classroom events like this one for age nine to 14 every Thursday at both 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern. Plus we've got plenty of other cool Explorer Classroom events that you and your teachers can check out on our website. Today, we are very lucky to be joining uh, Explorer Jeff Kirby. Jeff is an ecologist and an award-winning natural history photographer. He's at the forefront of blending photography, ecology, and technology to address conservation challenges, which is a very complicated sentence, but he'll make it seem really easy in a minute. Um, basically, his work has brought him all around the globe, but his very favorite places, those adventures that keep drawing him back, are found at the poles in really, really extreme environments. Today, he's gonna to teach us about one of his favorites, the Arctic. So we're gonna hear about his recent Arctic adventures. We're gonna see some breathtaking aerial images. We're gonna learn about how the rapid warming in the Arctic region is impacting plants and animals and permafrost and also all of us. But before we get to that, I do wanna acknowledge that we've got about a thousand students joining us today. It's not just me and Jeff. Um, our students represent places all around, um, all around the world, really. So today I wanna read off where we've got students registered to join from. We've got people in Alaska, California, Canada, Colorado, Delaware, the Dominican Republic. Jeff is in Denmark today. <laughs> we've got Florida, we've got Illinois, we've got Indiana, Massachusetts, Maryland, Mexico, Michigan, Missouri, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Texas, Washington, Wisconsin, so many cool places, probably more. If I missed where you're watching from, you can let me know in that YouTube chat bar. I'd be happy to give you another shout out. Um, but here comes the fun ones. Some special shout outs for some special groups out there who registered today. I wanna to give a shout out to Alana and Alec and the Campbell family, the Harvest Academy, the HB family, Isaiah, the Joes, Madam Lawson's class. Mr. Lito's grade six, Mr. Needle's class, Ms. Blouch's class, Ms. Johnson's fifth graders, Pamithi and Vinick, Rocky Solis, the Wing family, and Zoe. I'm so thrilled to have so many amazing students out there ready to learn all about the Arctic. Um, and for now, I think that that is plenty for me. I think it's about time that we turn it over to Jeff and get this lesson going. Great, should I uh, do a shared screen here? I think that would be awesome. All right, Let's see if this works. Are we, uh, we going? We're rocking and rolling. We can Let's see your screen see. great. Cool, all right. Well, I mean, this is a, a total treat to get to talk with everybody. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd tell you a little story, I guess, about doing some uh, Nat Geo related work in the Arctic um, and how we use this Arctic from above perspective to understand things. but. I might have actually titled this to expect the unexpected or how everything just about almost goes wrong. Uh, so to do a little basic, so we gotta know what we're talking about, right? So if you just imagine a globe and you look down from the top of the globe, you'd see the Arctic Ocean. And then all around that is some land and that's where the tundra is. So kind of make this map right here, I pulled out what the tundra is. And that's this kind of land where no trees grow, the soil is kind of permanently frozen beneath the surface. So you get little tiny plants all over the place. And um, I'll show you plenty of pictures of that. But this was a few summers ago, and I go up pretty much every summer to do research to understand uh, what's happening as the Arctic is warming really rapidly and what that does to the plants and animals. Um, I made the mistake of trying to work in two places in the Arctic in one summer, uh, which turns out is a really bad idea. 
but it's really interesting. So you got to take your chances. And so the first place was this island called uh, Kiki Tark. And here's a little uh, satellite image of that island. Uh, it's also called uh, Herschel Island, but in the Inuvaluit language, it's called Kiki Tark. This is what it looks like. Again, you don't see any trees. Uh, you can see a little family of musk oxen kind of standing out there. And this is a view from a drone. We use drones for all sorts of research. Uh, this is Ed, one of the park rangers. Uh, he's an Inuvaluit park ranger uh, that works at this area and helps with data collection. And um, he, along with many of my colleagues from universities all around the world and a special group called Team Shrub, we get down to the very nitty gritty and we count stuff. That's what ecologists do. We see when plants grow, how they're doing. Uh, if it's warmer, do they grow bigger? That sort of thing. Uh, this is my colleague, Isla Meyer Smith. She's also a Nat Geo Explorer and uh, she's one of the world experts at kind of understanding how shrubs are taking over parts of the tundra and replacing grasses as it gets warmer there. And here she is with one of her grad students, Gurgana, who's also a Nat Geo Explorer, who did one of these earlier in the week. So uh, I have very good company when I'm on some of these, these trips. And yeah, they focus on the really small things and how it connects to the huge um, tundra expanses that we see. Um, I don't know, can you hear this sound here? We can't, but I bet okay, we can good. imagine it. It's Look at all those bugs. But what I'm doing is complaining because this is my homemade drone and uh, I need a little bit of tape to make it work and the bugs are biting me in the face and everything. But this is a really good way to link those patterns that we see on the ground uh, to bigger areas. So we just chuck the drone up in the air and it takes all sorts of pictures and we can make like super resolution maps down to like sub centimeter level maps. So yeah, you can get up close to vegetation. Um, see how it's changing here, there, basically everywhere in the environment. And that's cool, but we don't only care about the vegetation. We also care about what the vegetation is on top of, because that's where all the carbon in the system is. So you see like thousands and thousands of years of dead stuff underneath the plants, and it gets buried under there and because it's the Arctic, it gets frozen and it gets trapped there. But as it starts to heat up in this region, those things aren't necessarily trapped anymore. And they can start to decompose like dead plants or dead animals that have been there for a long time. And then they go back up into the atmosphere as CO2 or methane, uh, which makes the planet warmer and the Arctic especially even warmer. So it's kind of one of these feedback potential things. And so with the drones, we can go and measure this, put numbers on it um, to help make better predictions. And so that's what I do when I join some of these teams. I take pictures, I use them for science, and I use them to um, uh, tell stories too. Just for a sense of scale, this is three years of that kind of landscape changing and that's the size of a soccer field there. So, I mean, you can just literally see the landscape changing in huge ways um, in no time at all, really. So anyway, I was working at this, at this island and I was like, all right, I have to get all the way over to the other side of the Arctic uh, to work with another team uh, that needed some, um, assistance with the drone stuff, because that's something that I've been doing a lot. And it's like, okay, you know, this is in a time period, unlike now when it was you know, still open to travel. And so I was getting ready to um, go to the beach because that's where the airplanes land, because uh, there's no runways or anything here. But then, you know, we get these storms coming in and um, all sorts of flooding hits the island. And this is a big problem throughout the Arctic is coastal erosion and um, kind of flooding and the runway like completely flooded. So the plane couldn't come in. So I was kind of waiting and waiting and realizing like, well, you know, in Russia, they're not going to wait for me to go out to this field site. And my, my days were ticking away. So luckily, um, I talked with Ed and he's like, well, if you want, we could try taking a boat across the ocean for like 12 hours and maybe we'll make it to the airport like a couple hours before your plane's supposed to depart from there. Um, but if the water gets choppy, we're gonna be stuck camping on the coastline somewhere for who knows how long. Um, so we gave it a go. Uh, luckily it worked out. I zoomed across all these other international connections, show up in Russia and it was a massive heat wave there. It was like almost hundred degrees Fahrenheit up in the Arctic, which is not a normal situation. That has all sorts of consequences for the plants and the animals, but I didn't know this at the time. It also changes how helicopters work. They can't lift as much weight when it's really hot out. 
And that was a big problem for us because we were bringing tons of steel poles, all this canned food, um, a portable sauna, and like eight or nine people out to this remote field site to do all this work. And the pilot was like, hey, uh, our helicopter can only take like 60% of the weight that we were planning now. So better start throwing things out because we're leaving soon and we can't bring all of it. We're like, oh no, like who thinks about a heat wave in the Arctic? So we're like, all right, do we throw away the steel poles, the portable sauna, our food, you know, cut a couple people off the trip? So we decided that we could just go fishing. So we left some of our food behind and uh, just jumped onto the helicopter. And we got lucky, we made it out there. It was absolutely miserable to be on the tundra when it's really, really hot though, because like it's a beautiful place when you're flying and like you get the wind from the helicopter and you see, you know, no trees, kind of lots of these little, little lakes and plants growing everywhere. Um, but it's an environment that uh, you have to wear long sleeves in still because there's all sorts of like, you know, insects and mosquitoes like you saw in that previous video. Anyway, so we went out there, we wanted to study specifically how the reindeer are influencing how the plants respond to a rapidly warming environment. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can go and interview um, people that live there full time, that work with the reindeer, that are herders with the reindeer to ask them what's happening. Um, or you can ask them advice on like, hey, like, where should we go to study? Like, we're only, we're only visiting here for a while. Uh, and then you can go measure the plants in those areas. Uh, you can collect reindeer poop from all of the environment and see where reindeer are pooping because that tells you where reindeer like to be. You can cut down shrubs and count the rings to see how they're growing, how old they are, if they've changed in like an old patch here, if there are more reindeer around. Or you can go out and just make observations on the reindeer themselves. So um, I went out there again with my cameras uh, to get some cool pictures. Um, but also to gather some data. So like, I don't, do you see all the reindeer in this photo here? But yeah, there's a huge group of them and they move around the landscape in interesting ways. Um, so it really influences how plants can respond. But yeah, the worst part, again, of really hot weather when there's no wind is that just the mosquitoes come out in droves and like they drive people crazy there because, you know, they're sucking your blood and everything. But it also like really annoys the reindeer too, because like people, they're mammals and um, mosquitoes like to suck their blood too. So it changes how the reindeer move around on the environment. They go up and stand on hills where there might be a little bit more wind, um, or they avoid these like um, areas down low where um, it's really, really warm. Uh, we had a couple of friends helping us. This bird joined our camp and would just land on your head and like eat mosquitoes out of your hair. Uh, that was, that was a, one of our, our favorite uh, additions to the, to the research team. But uh, yeah, we went out and we can film the reindeer, uh, see like their behavior, not just from the ground, but we can film them from above too, to see how they move across these different uh, parts of the landscape and where they stop to eat. And if that is something that's likely to change um, how the vegetation will respond there. But one of the most critical approaches we took uh, is partnering with the, the local um, indigenous people, the Nenets people that are reindeer herders. They're the ones that know the most about reindeer of anyone. And so um, this group I've been working with has been visiting this site for decades and they're old friends with many of these people. So we can bring maps and ask advice like, all right, where's a good place to build a really small fenced in area to keep the reindeer off of? So we can come back in three or four years and see what happens if there's no reindeer eating on this part of the tundra, but they are eating on this other part of the tundra. So um, we have interviews, consultations, we work together, and then we take all those steel pipes that we carried in the helicopter and pound them into the permafrost and make like small little fenced off areas. And you run a huge experiment that takes several years, but it will tell you things that you could never get just from observation alone. So here's us out there just pounding stuff into the permafrost. Um, unfortunately, it is like a heat wave, um, but we have to wear long sleeve clothes because of bugs. And then I get to go out and drone map the whole thing because that helps us uh, make comparisons later on. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like to launch the drone. And yeah, we, we go about this. This is, this is what our job is like. And again, I thought that that was going to be it, right? And then the clouds come in 
and the wind starts blowing. I'm like, oh man, like great, another storm, classic. But this was like a 50 mile an hour continuous windstorm that was gusting to 60 or 70. It was like flattening our tents and like blowing up tent poles. Um, this is Anna Scarin, one of the researchers trying to pound um, the, the tent pole back into the ground. This is Bruce Forbes. He's one of the ecologists that was leading this thing and his tent is broken. He doesn't look too happy in this picture. Um, so yeah, I get to run around and just take pictures of people's faces while everything's going to um, go into trouble. But luckily, um, the winds kind of died down and the helicopters couldn't fly in the storm. So we got trapped out there a couple extra few days. And then even when the winds died down, the helicopters called and said, hey, actually, we can't pick you up because all those winds stirred up some massive forest fires uh, down near where we're taking off from. And we're all like, covered in smoke and no one, no one is able to, to fly. And so I, don't know, I thought this was just kind of a one very short story about a summer in the Arctic. Now you can see the, the fires. Eventually the fires died down and they like they sent helicopters up and, and picked us up. And we all got to um, you know get one final picture before leaving. But it was it was an example where you know we go to the Arctic and we study how warming is affecting the plants and the animals and the permafrost and all the carbon and the people that live there. But it's also a good reminder that so many other things are changing there too. We're seeing coastal flooding and erosion. We're seeing massive heat waves happening when they shouldn't be and having all sorts of other effects. And we're seeing fires that are burning in parts of the region that like haven't burned in this way as far as we've ever known. And so, yeah, the Arctic is warming up and changing and influencing the entire global climate right now. But so many other parts of it are changing um, in parallel with that. And they're all related. But anyway, I thought I'd tell you that little quick story and I'm like really happy to answer any sort of question about what it's like to work there, to take pictures there. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to chatting. Jeff, you're exactly right. It's definitely question time. I know I have like a million questions. I'm starting to see questions come in on YouTube. Keep sending them in. Let us know who's asking so that we can give you a shout out. If you're up here on screen with Jeff and I and get those nice loud voices ready, I will call on you to let you know when it's your turn. But our first question is coming to us from an online viewer in Miss Merkel's classroom. Um, a student named Isaac is wondering what's the closest you've ever been to a reindeer? Oh, um, I've touched reindeer before. Yeah, it, in this area, the, um, the Nenets um, people, they kind of have a semi-domesticated relationship with the, with the reindeer. So they let them roam free during the day and they kind of push them around in these circles. They get bigger and bigger around the outside of their camp so they can munch on whatever they want. And then they'll bring them back into these enclosures um, at, at certain times. And uh, some of them are used to pull sledges and things like that. And so for those, you can go up and uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can touch them. But some reindeer in other places that are wild, um, they, they definitely won't let you do that. <laughs> Brilliant. And how big are these reindeer when you're, when you're next to them? They, they look pretty small from that aerial, but I'd imagine it's a, a little intimidating to walk right up to a, to a reindeer out in this environment. Well, it's, it's really interesting because I've worked all over in different places in the Arctic and the size and the shape and the way reindeer um, and caribou, which is the same species, um, how they look is, is really different depending on the place. So um, say up on Svalbard, this high Arctic island, they're really short and kind of stumpy. Here, they're kind of medium sized and have all different colored coats. And up in Greenland, um, there's some, some really large ones and, and the males are much bigger than the females. And um, they both have antlers. They're the only deer species where both male and female have antlers, but they're big enough that you pay attention to them. Oh yeah, well, we've got a great question from Raul Lopez. Uh, they're wondering what temperature is it supposed to be at the time of year when you took your adventure? Um, 100 degrees does not sound normal. No, 100 degrees Fahrenheit is, is absolutely not normal. Um, the Arctic in the summertime can be a pretty pleasant place temperature-wise. If we're talking Fahrenheit, uh, maybe in the 60s sometimes, but the defining feature is that it's really unpredictable and it can change really fast. So you might have a day where it's 60 or even 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and then the next day it could be down to like 30 or 20 degrees Fahrenheit. It's just one of these environments that uh, can just go all over the place. Um, whereas 
you know, the summers further south are, are much more predictable. And then in the winter time, it gets, it gets really, really cold. Well, related to all of that extreme and all of that change, we've got Peyton who's wondering what adaptations do animals up there have so they can deal with that kind of extreme and that kind of change? Oh man, they have so many really interesting um, adaptations. Just with the, with the reindeer, um, they have this kind of circulation in their, in their blood vessels that um, kind of keeps the, the warm blood closer to the inside part of their body and the cold blood on the way on the outside. So when they pump the blood back into their heart, it doesn't pump really, really cold, chilled blood into it and, and cause stress. Um, their eyes can um, see more in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum than human eyes can, which really helps seeing patterns on the snow um, because you can um, see things better in that part of the spectrum, uh, which is really important when you're living in kind of a dim, low light, but really white um, environment. Um, also, you know, they, they move huge distances. Uh, they can migrate and have huge stamina to allow them to track patterns of um, kind of weather and also food availability. So they'll migrate from north to south in, in a lot of regions. So they'll go south uh, in the winter time where it's a little bit warmer and there's better food for them. And then in the summer, they'll move hundreds of kilometers um, to these kind of tundra regions and um, be able to get newly growing plants that are really nutritious. So, I mean, that's just some adaptations in, in the reindeer. So there, you have to be a specialist if you're living in such an extreme environment. Awesome. Well, to shift gears a little bit from the animals to the technology, we've got St. Peter's and Paul, fourth graders in Miss Mann's class, and Jackson is wondering about the drones that you're using. Do you build them? Do you buy them? What different types are you using? Oh man, we have all different kinds of drones. And we've been doing this now for, you know, about eight or nine years. So we have a lot of experience and we've made a lot of um, hard lessons by crashing drones into random things. But I used to build my own. So I would just get like a, a model airplane kit and then you get a really small, um, like microcomputer, you can put it inside of it and um, put a GPS in it and then put like just a camera like inside of it and you wire it all together and send it off and it can fly for, you know, like 40 or 50 kilometers of transects taking pictures that you can then stitch together into, into a map. Um, but now we also buy a lot. I mean, here is an example of, you know, the kind of over-the-counter drone that you can buy. And these things are so capable. You can do uh, amazing work with, with stuff that you, you just buy um, off of any electronic shop. So it is kind of a, a mixed answer. Um, when you go to build your own stuff, there's all sorts of resources online. I'm not an engineer by training. So I just learned by reading message boards and, and kind of making mistakes. Um, um, or you can buy some stuff that um, already exists. And some of the coolest stuff is the cameras, not just the drones themselves, because they're just flying platforms, right? Uh, it's all about what, what you put on them. Speaking of what you put on them, we've got Mr. Needle's photography class, and they're wondering what the biggest adjustment you had to make as a photographer when switching to this aerial uh, footage was. Um, any big surprises you found learning to work in this new medium? Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of um, factors that you really have to think about. And so there's a couple ways to go. Um, one big challenge is switching between kind of narrative or um, aesthetic photography and scientific photography. Um, sometimes they kind of go in different directions. When I'm trying to have narrative pictures, mostly what I've shown you here, I really think about um, how the light can make things look pretty and kind of really frame things in a certain way. Whereas with the scientific imaging, um, it's all about trying to make things repeatable and to minimize unwanted um, influences on the color or on the um, kind of appearance of things. So all sorts of little vibrations or um, exposure blurring that can happen while you're flying drones, all of those need to be adjusted. And then there's a whole nother level when you're you know, balancing filming from drones versus photography from drones, often very, very different setup there. Awesome, well, let's visit an on-screen student with us. Let's go to a student in Maryland, Freya, go for it. 
What's your question? Hi. Hey. My question is, do you see an effect on global war warming on indigenous populations? Yeah, well, so the Arctic, as we've said, is warming faster than any other part of the globe, right? And people live in these areas and they really are associated with the land in many cases. So if you're relying on having the ecosystem function the way that it always has to live the type of life that you're used to, um, and that's changing, it has impacts on you. Some of these um, can be really problematic and others require you know, just slight adjustments and each case is, is different. But um, yeah, that's a, a very big question and a very important question. And a lot of people are trying to you know, figure out the answer to that one right now. All right, well, let's visit a classroom in Canada. We've got Miss Arnone's grade fours. I'm gonna ask to turn on your microphone. Can send somebody up to ask a question. What made you get into a photo guy? Photography. Oh, photography guy. <laughs> what made you get into photography? Yeah, that's a question that I get asked sometimes, and it was actually kind of an accident because I started off as a biologist and I was working um, or living for really long periods of time in the field, like living in tents and hanging out with animals all the time. And I would take pictures just because, you know, it's something to do. And then after I came back from these long things, I would show the pictures to people. And I was like, oh, look how cool this is. Isn't this interesting? And they didn't really think it was that interesting. They're like, eh, that's okay, I guess. And and then I really started to think about like, actually the pictures that I'm taking are not very good. Like I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty bad photographer. And so then I decided like, okay, like I'm gonna really take this seriously and think about how to make them look good. So then it became a process of trying and failing and trying and failing. And eventually I got better at it and I'm still learning all the time. Um, but yeah, it started by um, being a bad photographer and then wanting to get better at it. and. Uh, yeah, so that, that's how it happened. Awesome. We've got a student from the Birch School in New York with a question. Go for it, Spencer. Hi. Um, hey. Have you noticed any change? Have you noticed, um, where have you found the most um, change in the flora and fauna? Well, it's really cool when you get to go back to the same place year after year, because then you can see these kind of big but slow changes to a human perspective that are actually really fast changes from like a, a planetary perspective. And so one way that I've seen that is in just how shrubs are taking over parts of the tundra. Areas that used to be kind of these grassy fields are now covered in um, little birch and willow shrubs um, that are all over the place. So if you just showed up there one day and looked around, it would, it would seem kind of normal. But if you go many years in a row, you start to realize like how these changes are so big because they're happening all over the environment. Uh, so that's probably like one of the clearest ways uh, that I've been able to see it. It's harder to see in individual animals um, and less the populations are changing. And some you know, animals will like the changes that are happening and some won't like the changes that are happening. So, like anything in ecology, it can get very complex, but uh, that's what keeps it pretty interesting. Awesome. Well, we've got some locations that I missed in my shout outs at the beginning. So I want to be sure to say hi to our viewers in Puerto Rico and Colombia and India and also in New Hampshire. And we've got a question from Miss Champagne's class out in New Hampshire, and they're wondering how the lighting changes in the Arctic at different times of year. Yeah, um, this is also a trick to photography in the Arctic. Um, the sun doesn't go down in the summer. It just stays up 24 hours a day for several months. And then it's the opposite in the winter. There is no sun at all in the winter. So it's completely kind of dim or dark. Um, but one of the nice things for yeah, photographs is that you can get sunsets that kind of last for like three hours. And that's the light that always is the prettiest for taking um, kind of pictures of, of you know, plants and animals. So 
Uh, yeah, the light is unique to the Arctic and the Antarctic because the sun isn't very high up in the sky. It's kind of low in the horizon and it just circles around uh, down low in the summer. And then in the winter, it's just kind of dim all the time. We've got a great question from Miss Fox at the Birch School. She is wondering if the heat wave affects your drones the same way that it affects your helicopters. It didn't affect the drones as much as um, it affected the helicopters. I think because they um, are just kind of optimized um, to not carry that much weight uh, and work in a variety of conditions. But the kind of the opposite happens. They don't work very well when it's really cold because of the batteries. They Batteries just don't hold um, as much um, charge as they do when it's warmer out. Um, and sometimes they don't work as well at really high altitudes uh, because the air is thinner. So those are the two places where it's the toughest, when it's really cold and at high altitudes or really windy. Awesome. Well, we've got Joseph from Ms. Arbiel's class um, wondering what people do in the Arctic for fun and what your expedition group did for fun while you were up there. Yeah, well, I mean, People do the same sort of things that they do anywhere for fun. Um, you know, whether it's just playing games, um, you know, reading books, uh, you know, talking with people. Yeah, it's just regular life. Um, but in terms of what um, myself and, and some of my, my colleagues would do, um, yeah, we, we read a lot. Um, sometimes people will bring in musical instruments and they'll play those. Um, or just get to spend some time and really appreciate how special the place is. Um, it's easy to forget, um, you know, how wonderful it can be to be in nature. So it's nice. I'm away from my, my cell phone, away from all sorts of stuff. And you can just pay attention to, you know, plants and animals and insects. And that's kind of fun. I love that. We've got the students at Smithtown East who are wondering what kind of risks and dangers do you guys have to plan for at the start of these expeditions? Expedition planning is really complex and it takes a lot of time. It's not usually like the exciting part that I talk about in my, in my um, talks, but it does take up a lot of our efforts. And so yeah, there's many things to think about because um, oftentimes you're far away from a hospital. Um, I have an allergy to peanuts, so I have to be careful about, you know, what, um, food I eat when I'm in the Arctic. And if I get sick, then I can be in, in, in deep trouble. Um, you have to think about um, you know, wildlife. In some places where there's polar bears, uh, you have to be very, very careful. And you have to have um, safety training where you carry a gun with you, um, not to shoot the polar bears, mostly to shoot um, like loud bang things into the air. Um, but yeah, there's, there's many factors there. And then flying around on, um, small planes landing in, in some um, kind of rocky beaches and things comes, comes with some risk. So you have to really plan and take the pilot's advice very seriously. When they say something is overweight, you don't want to argue with them. It's not like trying to get a free bag at the airport, um, like at the regular airport. It's like, okay, like we trust that um, you know best. Awesome. We've got a Parna in the YouTube chat bar who is wondering what kind of results you can get from reindeer poop. What's something you've recently learned from, from that particular type of study? Well, this is actually really exciting. Um, two of my, my colleagues, um, Anna and Mariana, originally just published a scientific paper about reindeer poop. And what they did was in this Russia area um, that I described to you called Yamal, they had a grid of all these different sites where they went to and saw um, was there reindeer poop on the ground and what part of the environment was it. So basically they kind of went out with a map like this and they just went to all these like different grid points, saw if there was poop, cleaned off the ground and then came back like a year or two later to see if there was new reindeer poop on the ground. So what does that tell you, right? it tells you um, that reindeer were spending time in that area because they're constantly pooping. They don't like have a toilet or anything. They, uh, they just kind of poop as they're walking around. So if you find poop in an area, it means that they're using that area. And that's you know cheaper than putting a GPS collar or something on them. Uh, you can see, okay, like what part of the landscape do they prefer? These ridges where it's windy, these areas where there's lots of good food for them. It kind of 
helps us scientists figure out um, where they're most likely to influence the environment. And um, yeah, looking at their poops, a good way to do it. And there's all sorts of other stuff you can do too. I mean, poop is just stuff that you ate, right? So you can do DNA analyses on stuff in poop to see what animals are eating. And that's um, much easier than like trying to like sneak up on an animal and watch it while it's, while it's chewing stuff. Um, so yeah. Poop is a very, very rich resource for ecologists. You yeah, heard it here first. Poop is yeah. a, rich, a rich resource. I love that. Yeah. Let's visit a student named Oliver uh, for their question. Go for it, Oliver. Have you ever eaten caribou meat? And if you did, did you like it? I have eaten caribou meat. Yeah, it's actually a big part of diet um, in that part of the world. And uh, yeah, it was really, really good. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. We've got Bailey in Miss Mann's class who's wondering about the other things that you eat while you're um, up at camp. What are you eating? How are you cooking it? You mentioned fishing. How does that work? <laughs> it changes every place that we go to. Um, so some places I've had to carry my pack in just on a backpack for many, many miles. And in that situation, I try to bring food that's very lightweight. So I'll have kind of like freeze dried food that you can just boil, pour boiling water into. Um, that gets old after a while. Uh, some of these other places where you can fly a plane or a helicopter into, um, you can bring you know, pasta or um, you know, all sorts of non-perishable foods uh, with you and just kind of cook on camping stoves or some of these places even have buildings. And then there's one really interesting um, aspect of the island Kikitarik that we were on. Um, the indigenous people have used it for a really long time uh, as a kind of a hunting area, but there were also whalers that visited that area um, like a hundred years ago. And what they did is they kind of blew holes in the permafrost with dynamite. And then they uh, put like a roof on top of it. And what that made was like a refrigerator in the ground. And so, yeah, you can just like take a, a ladder down into this like underground refrigerator. And so we would bring stuff and just put it in the permafrost fridge. Unfortunately, because the, you know, the region is warming so much, there used to be a lot of these and now they're all collapsing uh, because the permafrost is, is not as um, structurally strong as it used to be. All right. Well, let's go to Miss Arnone's class for another question. Go for it, folks. Send somebody up to ask another one. What was your most exciting adventure? My most exciting adventure? Well, oftentimes it's really exciting the first time you get to go to an area uh, because you're seeing it with like totally new perspectives and everything is interesting and curious. So yeah, pretty much anytime I get to go somewhere new, uh, it's, it's exciting because you learn about stuff and you also kind of make mistakes. Uh, you can get lost. Uh, you can um, do kind of silly things by accident and then you get into some, get into some trouble, but uh, yeah, that's, my most uh, common adventures when I'm when I'm new to a place. Awesome. We've got Miss, oh, I'm sorry, Madame Lawson's grade fours who are wondering if you know what's causing the heat wave and the flooding. So the heat wave and the flooding are kind of weather events that are associated um, with um, climate. So weather is kind of highly variable. I mean, you know this, right? Summers are generally warmer um, where we are um, and winters are generally cooler, but on any given day, it could be raining, it could be um, sunny, it could be windy. What's changing as the climate changing is how often those things happen. So as climate changes and the temperatures get warmer in the Arctic, um, it changes how um, storms come through and those influence how flooding events happen. Um, it influences how the circulation of the air all over the planet changes. And that can bring really warm air up into areas that it normally doesn't get to go to. So 
The answer to that question is very, very complex in the details, but the very, very simple in the sense that as climate changes, it influences the frequency of um, extreme events. And those extreme events are things we expect to see more as um, the climate continues to change. All right, well, we've got Ariana who's wondering what the worst storm or weather event that you've ever been in is. <laughs> kind of related. Yeah, no, I, there's maybe a couple that stand out. Um, one, was this summer and it wasn't horrible. It, it caused our, um, our plane to get delayed by a week, but an, an example of what can happen in the Arctic, it was you know pretty nice weather up, uh, well, actually this was two summers ago, sorry. Uh, where it was up on Kiki Tarek with um, uh, Team Shrub, this group of researchers up there. And uh, it was kind of a nice summer period. And then all of a sudden it started snowing in August. So we got a snowstorm. And um, the storms were all over the region, so the planes couldn't come out. And I was kind of sick because I, I had some like mushroom poisoning or something. And then a polar bear came into the area. And so I was in my tent, you know, like kind of sick, and there was a polar bear going around. And um, so that combination of things was, was pretty interesting. I ended up moving into the building because of the, the polar bear. But uh, yeah, that was, that was a good one in the Arctic. Awesome. And Jeff, is there anything that you've learned in the Arctic that's changed how you live your regular life when you're not in the Arctic? Well, I think the Arctic is a really interesting place because it's kind of at the extreme of climates and um, low species diversity, which as an ecologist, you kind of see how the rules of um, species interactions can play out at the extremes. It's like a really simple but clear way um, to see how systems work. And when you start to learn about that and you come home and you kind of look out your window here, you realize like it's all the same stuff. So um, the Arctic has really helped me understand how the world works in a really more general sense. Um, and that's, I guess, part of the goal of, of why we go up there. That's amazing. And lastly, Jeff, do you have any general advice for all the young explorers out there watching today? Yeah, I, my Kind of simplest advice is if you get interested in something, um, follow up on it. There's so many opportunities that exist only if you ask for them. Uh, sometimes uh, it seems like other people get to do all sorts of cool stuff. And one of the things I've learned is like if you really push hard and try and go for stuff, you have a better chance of making it happen than if you don't. And most importantly, it's okay if it doesn't work out. Like I fail at things all the time. Like I get wrong answers. I like do stupid things. I make mistakes, but I think that's important. It's okay to, to make those things as long as you, you know, keep trying and um, have a good attitude. Well, what amazing advice. Thank you, Jeff. And for everyone who's learning along with us out there, we'd love to see what you do with this. Maybe Jeff inspired you to draw some comics or to write a story or to take your own aerial photography. Really, whatever it may be, Jeff and I and the whole team at Nat Geo, we would love to see your work. So you can have your teachers send that to us on Twitter. We're at Nat Geo Education and we use hashtag Explore Classroom. We'd love to help celebrate all of your cool exploration and work. Um, and if you just cannot get enough of the Arctic, I know there's a bunch of questions out there that, that we did not get to this morning, sadly. Jeff's teammate, Gargana, is going to be here with us at 2 p.m. Eastern for another Arctic event today. So we, we hope to see you there. Teachers, you can check out Explore Classroom plus many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. And students, thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful questions. Jeff, thank you so much for this, like, little dose of enthusiasm and Arctic adventure. I'm gonna turn on everybody's microphones and nice and loud before we sign off. Oh, here's my cat. Let's say goodbye and thank you to Jeff. Ready? Bye. Bye. Bye.